a Japanese man is sitting on a train, feeling lonely in the massive city of Kyoto, Japan. His new job for video game company Nintendo pays pretty well, but his heart misses the days of his childhood. He misses spending time with friends and family, because in this new city, in this new job, he was just another person. But back home, he was Katsuya Aguchi, the man who would create Animal Crossing. To fully capture the loneliness of the city, Iguchi began experimenting with ideas of how to turn his sombre experiences of living in Kyoto into an enjoyable game for kids. It was important that his vision didn't make kids depressed, because like, obviously Nintendo doesn't want that. It had to be charming, it had to be unique. And in 2001, Dobitsu no Mori released in Japan, and for the next few years Animal Crossing would release in America, Australia, and Europe, and it would be enjoyed by many people who gave the game a chance. When most people look at Animal Crossing, they say, oh, animals talking to each other, you know, like, am 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 what's the word, anthropomorph, anthropomorphic, anth anthropomorphic, animals that are like humans, that are just talking to you, and you set up a house, it sounds like a real, a real baby's game. But Animal Crossing has always been a video game that had a slight tinge of optimistic loneliness. Yes, you are moving to a new place, you know, you get all the freedom you want, do whatever you like, but you soon realize you have no friends, no money, and no job. And then you realize, oh no, this guy is just like me. Animal Crossing New Horizons released in 2020, a year where forming connections with people was no longer a viable option. New Horizons was released at a time where people could not socialize. People were so desperate for this game, they wrote a letter to Nintendo to release it earlier than planned. Dear Nintendo, ooh ooh and hello. We are the Nintendo fan club of Discord, Reddit, 4chan, whichever the worst one is. And we would like you to release the Animal Crossing New Horizons game a week early so I don't have to talk to my family. Obviously, Nintendo were so touched by this letter that they cancelled the game completely. People loved it. It got outstanding reviews. Everybody on Twitch and YouTube seemed to be making streams and videos about this game. Even those who had never played Animal Crossing played this one. Even Video Game Donkey was getting in on this one. Oh, sea bass. I didn't know they had sea bass in this game. We'll put him right there. Its success in sales knew no bounds, passing the likes of Super Mario Odyssey, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and even Balan Wonderworld. But if you ask a fan of the franchise if they thought this game was great, the answer isn't always so crystal clear. So why is this? Why is the most popular, most successful, most played Animal Crossing game the one that the fans are most mixed on? And after writing this video essay, I think I might just know why. Let me tell you why Animal Crossing New Horizons failed from its success. This video will showcase every problem I personally have with New Horizons, so feel free to disagree with anything in the comments, but a lot of what I will say is factual information on how New Horizons feels so different from the previous games. I am in no way expecting this video to change your outlook on New Horizons or to diss Nintendo employees who worked on this game because they did a very good job. I'm making it out of love for the franchise and to document why this game doesn't work for a lot of fans. So, Animal Crossing games do not have a plot. I mean, the plot is sort of what you make it in these games. You're the main character. You are the protagonist of your own story. Animal Crossing New Leaf gave a little bit of plot, allowing you to become a mayor once you arrive in the town, but after that, it's the same as the previous games. The goal in every Animal Crossing game is to make your own goals. The NPCs are there for you to meet and play with, but your story is what you make it yourself, and your goals are always up to the player 
never, ever the game. The game may point you in a direction to say, oh, no, you gotta catch some fossils or you gotta catch some, some bugs to fill up this museum, but you don't have to do it. You definitely don't have to do it to experience some features in the game. New Horizons gives the player a plot and goals. You go on a deserted island retreat with zero money to your name because you're a broke little lad, and then you have a dream about a dog playing guitar. This is K.K. Slider, and the overall goal that this game introduces is to get him to perform a concert live at your island. So to do this, you need to make your island look as presentable as possible. And how do you do that? Well, a little bit of imagination and a degree in architecture, agriculture, and city planning. This is one of the reasons why many people didn't play New Horizons for too long. Not the fact that there is a goal to achieve, but once you pass this goal and KK Slider arrives to your town, there is really nothing left to do aside from the basic Animal Crossing stuff that we've done in past games. Improving your house, fishing and bug catching, fossil collecting. But it feels like you've finished the game based on the way that you've completed the game's main goal. Wait, I just see credits? Have I done it? <laughs> Did I beat Animal Crossing? But to get KK Slider there, it, it feels longer than a tutorial should be. It takes weeks to do this, which is why it feels like it's the main part of the game. It feels like this is the game's goal, and once you finish it, the game ends. The game drops off a cliff after this moment, after you complete the KK Slider going to your island thing, because despite it playing like the old games now, it feels emptier, because the game gave you something to do, which was never done in any Animal Crossing game before. It feels like the game should be giving you more to do after you complete this goal, or nothing to do in the first place, which is what the other games did, if that all makes sense, which it does because I'm right. Animal Crossing is not a game that should force the player to achieve something. If you don't achieve this goal, you're locked out of a lot of things, a lot of new features that this game promotes. Stuff like terraforming the island and placing paths aren't in the game until you complete this KK Slider thing. Even the iconic hourly music isn't added into the game until you finish this goal. Overall, this is one of the biggest reasons why I think people got so bored of the game so quickly. It changed up the Animal Crossing formula in such a way, it made people feel like once you completed the KK Slider thing, you completed the game. It says it right there in the title, Animal Crossing. They are an essential cog in the machine that is this game, because they're what makes Animal Crossing stand out from any other life simulator games. If you've read about some Animal Crossing discourse online anytime recently, you may have heard something along the lines of the villagers being too nice in Animal Crossing New Horizons. Well, what do you mean by too nice? This game can be played by actual babies. Why is that a bad thing? It is a bad thing, and here's why. I'll give you an example. Say, you have a friend, right? Just in this hypothetical situation. You have a friend, and they always say positive stuff about you, are around you and not around you, right? They never critique you, they never judge you. It's just having a yes man, right? That's, that's all that is. Now imagine that, but for 10 different people. The older Animal Crossing games blended the perfect cocktail of nice and mean. They would sometimes compliment, sometimes critique. They'd crack jokes at your expense. This makes these 3D models feel alive in some weird way. New Horizons villagers just feel so programmed, like their sole purpose is to kiss your ass and give you gifts in the mail. The basic interactions you have with villagers are just, you, know, you walk up to them, and you say, oh hi, and then they say, oh hi Dino, your clothes look great. Is that a new haircut? Do you like the fountain I gifted you in the mail? Oh, it was hell trying to get it in that little envelope. Water got everywhere and I dislocated my ankle trying to send it at the post office, but I pulled through because my love for you was so strong. Point is, their attitude almost never changes, and I think that this is a factor as to why talking to the villagers in the game feels so pointless. In a 2020 game developer conference, devs of New Horizons revealed that making the animals do things on their own was a vital part to making them feel more real. This addition to the game, I believe, is brilliant because it's true. Seeing your villagers do stuff like yoga, or reading a book under a tree, or drinking a soda, really do well to aesthetically bring the villagers to life. Whereas in past games, all the villagers would do is walk around the place. This doesn't fix the main problem, however. Villagers are more expressive and display more personality than ever before, 
but only when you're not talking to them, which is the reason why they are there in the first place. For New Horizons, you get these rewards called Nook Miles. It's a form of currency you obtain when you do chores around the island, like selling fruit, shooting balloons, etc, etc, etc. But I have a problem with one of the ways you can get these Nook Miles. One of the objectives is talk to three villagers. And while yes, this encourages players to talk to their villagers and to not abandon them, I feel like you should not be rewarded or enticed to do this. Like talking to your villagers should not be a chore that you are rewarded for, it should be a part of the game that the player themselves wants to do with their own merit. But then I realize why they made this a chore. The dialogue is unbelievably repetitive. This might be a common argument among this game's fan base, but hear me out, right? This game actually has a lot of dialogue, believe it or not. This game has so much dialogue in it, so many paragraphs for any situation you find them in. If they're reading under a tree, they'll close the book and they'll say, oh, I'm just sitting here under a tree. Yeah. But the problem is, most players will never see half of this dialogue. There is so much dialogue in this game, but there's not enough from where you will see it from the villagers most, and that is when they're outside and you just feel like talking to them. They have such limited things to say. You know how I know there's so much written text in this game? The mail. The mail letters that you get in the post. I didn't even bother reading a lot of the mail in the previous games, but in New Horizons, villagers will write about the article of clothing they're gifting you. If it's a pair of shoes, they'll write about the shoes. I, I genuinely don't think I've read a similar letter in this game in my three years of playing it, which I commend because that takes a lot of work. But why couldn't they do this for the dialogue? Or give the villagers a little bit of sass, you know, just just something. The only way to irritate these villagers is if you hit them with a net. Yeah, it, it takes physical violence to make them react in a different way to you. I feel like maybe it shouldn't be like that, you know? I get that kids won't want their favorite villagers to smack talk them all the time, but I mean, it's important to teach kids that people can be mean sometimes. Giving them a land where everyone is happy and nice is not a bad thing. But for adults and teens who play this game, which a lot of adults and teens play this game, it just makes every villager feel soulless. The villagers can have up to eight personalities. Cranky, Smug, Jock, Lazy, Uchi, Peppy, Snooty, one, two, three, four. and Normal. Yeah, that's right, Normal is a personality. I think you can tell what they are based on the names, obviously, like the lazy characters are, you know, more, more lazy and lounging and, and laid back. And the, you know, the peppy villagers are the ones that are so hyped up. But you can have 10 villagers in your town at one time. Which means, yep, at least one personality will be repeated in your town. For example, if I have Cube, a lazy personality type in my town, and Rodeo, another lazy personality type in my town, they will share the same dialogue, the same jokes, the same reactions. They are basically clones of each other. How could you form any connection with either when you already know what they're all going to say? Don't get me wrong, the past games had some problems with this as well, but in New Horizons it just feels so prevalent because every time I go up to either of the villagers they say the exact same thing. And the rare times that they do say something different, it's in a weird situation where you meet them at a cafe or something and you've, you've never heard that line of dialogue before. They look so expressive when they're walking around, but then when you go to talk to them, it's just like talking to a robot. I, I don't mean that in a bad way, Cephalobot, you know, you know how it is. I'm not surviving the robot takeover. Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer was a spin-off game to the popular 3DS game, Animal Crossing New Leaf. It was basically Animal Crossing, but for people who only like the styling their house part of the game. Kind of like those people who only play The Sims to decorate their house. The ability to decorate stuff was expanded upon and I really enjoyed it. Of course, you could also just fill a room full of toilets and call it a day. Wow, look at this place! I can't believe I get to live in such a lovely room! <laughs> It was a good game, and had enough stuff to keep it unique, 
but really, if it came out in 2023, it would have probably just been DLC. Which is exactly what happened with New Horizons when the Happy Home Paradise DLC dropped. Not only could you design as many houses as your little heart desired, but the update also let you change some things about your villagers. You can now change their homes, both interior and exterior, as you pleased for a small sum of a couple thousand bells. I am all for a little customization in games, but I need to explain why this amount of customization hurts this game overall. What I pointed out earlier was that the animals in the older games had a lot of personality. Well, they also had a thing called free will. In New Leaf, for example, once a villager moved into your town, the spot that they placed their home was unchangeable. New Horizons now lets the player choose wherever the villagers must live, which is a good addition, I won't lie. In terms of laying out your island, this is very useful, nay, essential. But the problem arises when a villager wants to leave. In the older games, if you didn't play the game for like a week, or so, your favourite villager, or a villager you couldn't have cared about to be honest, could have moved away without you knowing until you booted up the game to see their house replaced and a goodbye letter in your mailbox. In New Horizons, you could skip 200 years into the future, you could be a time wizard, you could, you could skip into the year 5023, and your town will have the exact same people, in the exact same places, doing the exact same things, it will be the exact same, except for a couple of weeds, of course. For these villagers, there is a lack of free will in New Horizons. Which sounds weird, because they're just code. Yeah, I get it. They're not actual real people. But the fact that every villager must ask you before they can leave is weirdly dystopian. They feel like collectibles that are unable to escape from this island. You're basically building Alcatraz when you invite them into your island. But I know. If those villagers can't leave, doesn't that mean you can keep your animal friends forever? How is that bad? It is a blessing and a curse, because it takes the entire message behind Animal Crossing, the entire theme and the meaning of the game, and it just breaks it, because of customization. The older games had this solemn charm to them, where any day could be the last day you could see this villager. Any time you log back in, the thoughts of how things might have changed enter your mind. It's this kind of emotion that is lacking in New Horizons, because I know when I log back in after a month of not playing, Rodeo's big dumb head will still be there whether he likes it or not. And the reason why they couldn't just let villagers leave whenever they wanted is because you can spend money on changing their houses and changing the exterior and interior of stuff, and it would feel like a waste of money if they just moved house next day. The game had to keep these villagers here for the customizable part of this game. Animal Crossing has always had its customizable aspects to it, of course. Decorating your house and putting on your sick drip was always a core part of the game. Morphing your house from this ramshackled shed into a more stylish ramshackled shed made it feel like it was your little slice of the island. Now, this entire island is your slice of the island. And that is where placing items outside arrives into this video. If you didn't know, New Horizons allows players to place items outside. Whoa! Now, believe it or not, this has never actually been in the game before. And now, we have an excuse to go out and touch grass. And if you've been watching the New Horizons footage so far, you may have realised my island is fucking swag as hell. Look, here's my farm, and here's my amusement park, and here's the pipe that leads to... Places. And the addition was badly needed to this game, so am I going to complain about it? No. But hear me out. There is the option to terraform your island, and as you can see by my 90 degree angled river, I'm a master at using it. Basically, you can now change the land and shape it into whatever you'd like. In the past games, you were stuck with whatever random town that the game gave you. But New Horizons gives people the option to change it whenever they want. Once you've passed the, the KK Slider part again, of course, like, the, the, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Now, these aren't bad additions, but I think it's one of the few reasons why people may feel the charm has gone out of the game a little bit. In past games, you were arriving to a pre-established town that already had shops and villagers and, and everything in it. Then New Leaf changed things around by allowing you to become the new mayor. You could build bridges and benches and many other work projects for a little fee rather than just placing them down like items like you do in New Horizons. I think this really worked well because despite you becoming the mayor of the town, you still play like you're just another villager. They may address you as the mayor sometimes, but at the end of the day you're still the newest person to 
move into this town. There was nothing gameplay wise that really changed anything that made you feel superior to your neighbours. In New Horizons, you are practically the god of the town. When you first start the game and go to the island, you are immediately given the title of Resident Representative, which basically translates to, eh, hey, do anything you like, kid, go nuts. <clears throat> That's my Tom Nook impression. <coughs> this is why New Horizons does not feel or play like an Animal Crossing game. You're no longer a little lad moving into a humble town, you're an island designer in charge of everything. Let me be clear, the designing aspects are quite fun but they're just not what an Animal Crossing game should be about. This game in particular tries to please every type of player who could play the game, and in the end, they don't fully satisfy any of them. Some people just don't want to customize their island, but after you complete the KK stuff, that's really all there is to do. Even the customization players that this game caters to the most run into problems. The game limits you by not allowing any items higher than the third layer of your town, of course, at the beginning of this game's launch, people managed to find ways around that. People used to make castles and decorations up there. Of course, Nintendo patched this out, so they can't do that now. The best customization things in the game, like partition walls, pillars, villager house editing, are all stuck behind the DLC expansion. Paths can't go in a diagonal angle without looking weird and clunky, and the fact that the stairs in the museum don't line up is annoying. Okay. Now that the ramble is out of the way, I think it's time to just take a small break so I don't get myself so riled up. Ah, these little bastards. DIY recipes are a mechanic introduced in New Horizons that allows the player to build items with ease as long as they have the materials for it. For example, collect three sticks and you can combine them to make a campfire. What a lovely little feature. There's definitely nothing wrong with this feature at all, Dino said before exploding into a zillion shards of glass. The biggest problem I have with these DIY recipes is that they are impossible to keep track of. You can get them from messages in bottles that show up every day on your beach, and you can get them from your villagers too. You also get starter recipes at the Nook store, hooray! Here's the kicker though, there are hundreds of recipes. and you get repeats all the time. There is no limit to how many times you can get these same recipes. One time I got the same recipe twice in one day for the same item, I got the same thing. And there's no counter, so I don't know how many recipes there are without looking it up. I don't know how many I have, I don't know how many I need to get. And the fact that some recipes need other DIY items to make them drives me out of my tree. This item here, my dear viewer, this ironwood, kitchenette recipe. This recipe can be bought near the start of the game, right? Before you even do the KK Slider thing, I'm pretty sure, you, you can get this DIY recipe. But to make it, I need the recipes for both the cutting board and the iron wood dresser. As you can see on screen here, this is the two things I need. I have over 1,000 hours. 1,000 hours from over three years of playing this game, and I have still yet to get the recipe for an iron wood dresser. This game needs to update how crafting operates, because feeling the need to go online to find someone to give me the recipe is horrific game design. I should never have to sink so low to get a sink in a video game. And while we're on the topic of tools, they break now. If this is your first Animal Crossing, you may not have known this, but tools never broke before this game. They break now to have an excuse to get you to use the crafting system. First of all, unless they have flimsy in the name, these tools shouldn't break. Or if they can break, let the player see how long it has left until it breaks. In Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, you could use a weapon like a stick, right? And you could hit a, a, a bokoblin a couple of times, right? And it will flash saying this item is damaged, so you know you only have one or two more tries with it before it breaks. New Horizons does not let you know how many hits you have left on your shovel, on your net, on your fishing rod, it just does not tell you. You have to, again, look it up online to see how many hits it takes, and then you have to count how many times you use the item, and then you can make sure that the item doesn't break. 
letting the player know that the item is nearly damaged is a good idea, that way you can craft something to fix it. But it's a good thing that these golden tools don't break due to how hard it is to get them. This game is testing me. So golden tools do break. I think if you spent enough time playing this game, you should have the ability to not care about your tools breaking. Especially if you make a golden tool. That takes a gold nugget to get, and those aren't exactly the easiest item to get in this game. Anyway, the system of tool breaking sucks, because you can legit just buy nets, fishing rods, shovels, axes, slingshots from the Nook store. It's just even quicker to buy them because, for example, to build a shovel, first you need to make a flimsy shovel, and then you need the flimsy shovel to make a proper shovel. Just buy the shovel instead, it's easier. As you can tell, I'm way too passionate about this game. Having the golden tools be unbreakable, or having any visual indicator that your tool is nearly broken, will be way better than the current system of fuck around and find out. People hate the fact that you can't craft in bulk, you know, like, like fishing bait for example. It takes one clam to make fishing bait, and you can press A and then, you know, you're making the fishing bait and you have one fishing bait. For fishing, people often dig up a lot of clams, so they want to make them in bulk, you know, to prefer, so it doesn't take half an hour to just make the fishing bait. But in New Horizons, you cannot craft in bulk, so it takes half an hour to get fishing bait that you throw away. You might not even catch the fish you're looking for. It's a disaster. It's a disastrous system, and I really hope the next Animal Crossing game fixes it, because th th this, this needs to improve. I'm gonna have to have a cold shower after this video. I am really, wor I am really getting worked up. In Animal Crossing New Leaf, the developers decided it was a good idea to remove the shops from the main town area like they had in the previous games, and place them in an area called Main Street. This way people could decorate their towns more while still having the shops close by. There were shops like Kicks, which was a shoe store, Shampoodle, the hair salon, Able Sisters clothes shop, the garden centre run by Leaf, the Nook store, Nook Homes, the post office, a club run by Dr. Shrink, the Dream Suite and a Psychic Place. The museum is up here too, by the way. I know that sounds like a lot of shops, right? But want to see how many there are in New Horizons? <coughs> two. There are two shops. The Able Sisters Clothes Store and the uh, Nook Store, Nook's Cranny. The 2.0 update actually introduced an expansion into Hards Island. It introduced Kicks, Leaf and Katrina, the shoe store owner, the garden center owner and the psychic. They now have little minivans or whatever, little miniature versions of their stores as well. But these are so out of the way, you have to leave on a jet plane to actually get there. They also visit once a week, but that's not very good compared to being able to go any day from the previous games. The main shop I need to bring up in this section of the video is Nook's Cranny. In New Horizons, Nook's Cranny has one shop upgrade that is absolutely terrible, and let me explain why. If you didn't know, upgrading the shops was a massive part of New Leaf, because when you originally arrived to the town, there is so little up in Main Street. There's only Nook Homes, the post office, Nook's Cranny, the museum, that is it. The more that you expand on your town and the more you play, the more shops start to pop up. And the more stuff you bought, the better that the store got. Nook's Cranny would upgrade from a small shed to a supermarket, and eventually you can even upgrade it to an emporium. The current fully upgraded store in New Horizons looks like this in comparison. It's actually funny seeing them side by side because wow. Inside you have five total furniture items you can buy along with wallpaper and stuff stacked in the shelves. This is absolutely nowhere near as good as New Leaf, where the fully upgraded shop has three floors. On the first floor, you have tools and other items like stopwatches, megaphones, fortune cookies, stuff that New Horizons just completely fucking got rid of. You also had two KK Slider albums you could buy here. Hooray! The garden center is also a part of this area where you could buy flower seeds or tree saplings, shrubs, bamboo, even fertilizer. But that's all on the first floor, by the way. That is just the first floor alone. The second floor has a host of furniture items and has dedicated areas for ground items and wall items. It also has new wallpaper and flooring. The third floor is the designer area owned by Gracie Grace, a giraffe who has extortionate prices for the most outlandish looking furniture. Although her stuff is expensive, she does have a sale on at the end of each month, and what I loved about these sales was that if you arrived later in the day, stuff would actually be sold out. And why is this important? Well, it gives a great illusion that the villagers actually 
buy stuff there. It also incentivizes you to play earlier in the morning to grab these items for cheap before anyone else can get to them. Well, cheaper than the usual prices because the, the prices are still mad. 8,000 bells for a goth dress? Man, I'll take out a loan. Somebody has to slay in this town. My biggest problem with how New Horizons tackles the shops is that it takes away all those upgrades. You upgrade the place once and that's it. No designer items, no special furniture, and most importantly, no fertilizer, which is absolutely heartbreaking. To put into a word, it's underwhelming, because I guess they wanted to keep that humble shop design sort of thing since you're on a deserted island after all. But no, why give the players the ability to place roads and traffic lights, vans and cars? The shop badly needs an update, at least visually. Actually, in New Horizons, it would make more sense for the upgrades to be longer than in previous games, because in New Horizons, you're actually building your own town yourself, and these upgrades would make it feel like you're making more progress, even after after you complete the KK Slider thing, which is actually something the game should do. It should incentivize you to, to update the stores more. The fact you can't build other shops either is a sin. I think there should be an option to invite the shopkeepers from Harz Island onto your island. That way people with no room can still visit them at Harz Island, but people who want more buildings in their town can easily just invite them. The fact that the post office was replaced with a stand. This put Pelly and Polly out of work. One more shop I need to talk about, retail. This was the only store in New Leaf that was actually in your town area. And what did it do? It was a secondhand store type of thing, where you could buy items that people had left in for much cheaper than usual. This is a brilliant idea because the game won't care if the items are secondhand or not. You're just getting these items for cheap, which is which is great. You, the player, could also put items up for sale and charge just as much, and even more than Gracie Grace does, for her ridiculous designs. The item probably won't get sold for that amount, but hey, you miss 100% of the shots you miss. And also, it's funny as hell to just like put up a fridge for like 10,000 bells and expect somebody to buy it. Retail was such a charming concept because it was another way of interacting with villagers and making it seem more like a community. I remember pushing Tank the Rhino around the shop trying to get him to look at my piano I had on sale. Of course, he was never going to buy it, but I was, you know, if you pushed him around enough, he would eventually take interest in it. Stuff like that was cool. Alas, retail never returned, and in New Horizons, the owner's recent Cyrus were reduced to furnishing your items. That's literally all they do. But hey, New Horizons added Wisp to island life, hooray! So now you can scare him into pieces and then have to go on a wild goose chase trying to find all the different pieces of him and then you figure out, oh, you have to catch him with your net and then you accidentally hit Wisp with the net because like, oh, I, I thought you were the orb, sorry, and, and then you actually have to run around like a mad thing around your island trying to find the last orb and then it appears over a river so you have to wait forever to get it and then it floats to the other side of the riverbank so you have to skedaddle your skinny ass all the way to the other side of the river and then you have to catch the orb and then you have to run back to Wisp and give him his orb parts and in return which he gives you <laughs> fuck you Wisp now this section of the video is not really the game's fault Kind of. This part of the video is about Animal Crossing's fandom and community ever since the release of Animal Crossing New Horizons. Now don't get me wrong, before New Horizons, there were bad aspects of the community as well. There were bad people who played this game and participated in online spaces, but nothing compared to what happened in the peak of New Horizons popularity. Sit back in your chair, preferably so far back that you cannot hear or see anything from this video because the stuff that happened in this community in 2020 was bonkers. In the words of Randy Feldface, Here's how this shit went down. So what happened? Well, this is Raymond, a smug type personality cat with heterochromia, which is the thing where one eye uh, is a different color to the other eye, as you can see here. Since New Horizons didn't introduce many new villagers, the few new ones that were released were often the most popular. There were only eight new villagers when this game released, so people who went villager hunting were extremely desperate for these particular villagers. The most popular by far 
was Raymond. I don't exactly know why, maybe it's because everyone loves Raymond, uh, maybe it's because his design, maybe his heterochromia eyes, maybe it's, it's the tuft of bleached hair that sways in the breeze, I have no idea. Maybe it's because he's dressed like the boss baby, who knows, right? But people wanted him, they needed him, and whenever somebody got Raymond on their island, they would snap at the opportunity to sell him. Selling a villager? What the hell? You can't do that, can you? They can do that. My point earlier about your villagers not being allowed to leave whenever they want comes into effect here because when you do decide to let them go, the next day they would pack their things and clean their house before disappearing the following day. During this in boxes period, which is what it's called, anyone from any town could visit the island and pay millions of bells or, or any other form of currency just to speak with Raymond to get him to move to your town. Anyway, yeah, people profited off of selling the cat, and obviously people got scammed by doing this as well, so... Hooray for the Animal Crossing community. It doesn't stop there, though. At Animal Crossing's peak, Raymond was being sold for actual human money, for real-life dollars, euro, wonga, dosh, actual currency in real life. Genuinely, people made financial profit in real life by selling a fictional cat on a video game. This was happening during a worldwide pandemic, and I'm convinced that that is partially the reason why these people went to such lengths, such insane lengths, to get a cat. Now, the reason why people may justify this horrendous financial decision is the amiibo card functionality of the game. If you didn't know, Animal Crossing allows the player to touch any villager's amiibo card to the Nintendo Switch, and the villager will instantly visit the campsite and you could just ask them to move in with you. So it's a good way of getting the villager that you want without having to go online to find somebody who has the villager. I, I, I don't I don't have an amiibo card, so um Aww. However, as Raymond and the other seven are new characters, they don't have amiibo cards yet because they released during the releases of Happy Home Designer and uh, the, the other game for the Wii U. I think people tend to like to forget that one. So spending money on him was sort of justified since in a way it was no different to buying an amiibo card. But uh, amiibo cards can't scam you, so like, yeah. Also, the new villagers got amiibo cards the following year, which begs the question, why didn't they release them with the game, and why did it take a year to stock them on the shelves? Like, the entire reason why he was so popular, and why people got scammed in the first place, was because there was no legal way to get him without either being lucky or going to someone's island. This would have saved people so much more hassle. Since then, though, the community has chilled a little bit. The game isn't as active as it was, people aren't Raymond obsessed as they used to be, but wow. It's a bizarre occurrence to see people go to such lengths for a character in a video game. The other most notable event was this image here. The Space Buns controversy was an absolute disaster of an online argument caused by a Twitter user for posting this picture in November 2020. This hairstyle that is obtainable in the game offended people when they saw it being worn on a white player. The space buns, which were also called Afro Puffs, were identified as a black hairstyle, and many took offense to the fact that a white person wanted to have this hairstyle in an Animal Crossing game. Many people were very frustrated with her, many people were very angry at her, and being the internet, it only took a matter of days before she was sent awful threats and messages over Twitter, as well as being doxxed. Obviously, some black players didn't care who used the hairstyle, some did, and if that's an issue they feel like being upset over, that's completely fine. But doxing and sending life-threatening messages? over Animal Crossing? Is this cute game really the cause of racism arguments? I mean, the Animal Crossing community can have the most monstrous, horrible people on the planet. Due to the massive sales of New Horizons, the game obviously garnered a larger fan base than other Animal Crossing games. There was always going to be people like this, but the Animal Crossing community can sometimes be the definition of how looks can be deceiving.
So we return to the title of this video. How did Animal Crossing fail from its success? Well, this game was very hyped up by fans. I mean, there hadn't been a home console version of Animal Crossing since the release of City Folk in 2008. And steadily throughout the years, the franchise became more and more successful. Horizon sold 30 million copies, which if you didn't know, is more than all the previous mainline games combined. So financially for Nintendo, this game was a major success. From the fans' perspective though, the game always seemed to miss something. A lot of charming aspects of the previous games were just gone. Nintendo could have given the game tons of updates for years to come, like they did for the uh, phone application, what's it called? Pocket Camp. I, I don't play it, by the way, if you couldn't tell. But they didn't need to. The game was a major success. Adding more stuff over a long period of time was just not a very good business decision. Because, well, they already got all the money they could get. I believe Animal Crossing New Horizons failed from its success because most of what the developers decided to focus on in this game were never really important to Animal Crossing as a franchise. Town building, limited lines of dialogue, everything I talked about in this video just there, Nintendo focused on pleasing every type of fan that liked the game, and did so much that it killed the original concept and heart that I believe many of the older games showcased so much. Remember the start of this video? The entire reason why I told you about Katsuya Eguchi is to showcase how Animal Crossing started compared to how it is now. It was once a game designed and programmed to make people feel less lonely, but now it's a shell of its former self. Contrary to what this entire video may have you believe, I still liked New Horizons as a game. It was legitimately fun, and for some it continues to be. And that's great, but it's not a good Animal Crossing game. To please the most amount of people, the developers needed to give the player more creative freedom, and in a way, it's a positive and a negative thing. The older games always had that charm and, and, and basically everything I said that was missing from New Horizons in this video, but if New Horizons had all of that charm, I don't think it would have been as successful. Animal Crossing is an acquired taste. Some people like it, some people find it boring, some find it relaxing, some find it frustrating. Introducing all of these new elements and ideas keeps the series fresh and more likely to tempt people into trying it. The series is not just talking to villagers and moving into a new town anymore, it's evolved from that, and whether we like it or not, it is good for the franchise in terms of mainstream popularity. If you really like the style of the older games, the older games will always be there to play. Because really, aside from new villagers and dialogue, the older games are almost perfect Animal Crossing games. The formula went unchanged for three games straight until New Leaf struck a good balance between old and new. But New Horizons is taking the franchise to new places, to new heights. And even if you dislike the game, you have to admit, it was absolutely necessary to keep the franchise fresh. It succeeded as a game, but it failed as an Animal Crossing game. And if that's the direction that Nintendo are going with Animal Crossing, who knows? Maybe things will get better soon. Maybe they'll strike that perfect balance again. To finish this video, I thought it would be nice to give a short anecdote of why I have a connection with this game and why I think games in general can be so good for the soul. One day in uh, May, I believe it was, during the 2020 lockdown, I was playing New Horizons and showing my parents around the town. I went through the museum, showed off all the items I had and my massive big house. Eventually I got to the part of my island that had Lily of the Valley flowers. My dad was half watching but I showed him the Lily of the Valley and he took a second and looked at them and said, yeah, those were dad's favourite flower. It took me by surprise a bit because they were also my favourite flower. I never got to meet my grandfather but I found it amazing how through a game I found a familiarity with him. Through a game, without even knowing it, I would find a flower that we both thought was our favourites. He passed two years before Animal Crossing ever released, but I feel like if he were still here today, he'd love to play this game. And although I've always wished I could have met him, whenever I look at that Lily of the Valley flower, it makes me feel like I already have. And to me, that's what Animal Crossing will always be about.